just south of the Arctic Circle, the Earth's heart beats close to the surface. Regular volcanic eruptions demand frequent revisions of the map as islands appear or change overnight. Surtsey emerged from the seabed in 1963. Another of the Westman Islands, Jaime, split open in 1973. In Iceland, steam is a normal presence in the landscape among snow-capped mountains of lava and deserts of sulphurous ash. Iceland lies between America and Europe, not that far from the silent frozen mass of Greenland. Much of it is harsh and unwelcoming. But in the northeast, there's a remarkable oasis, a lake called Mivatn. Here, there is a break in the lava deserts, where a shallow basin is watered by hot springs. Mivatn in English means the lake of flies. Pools of boiling mud indicate that volcanic activity is still very much present in this area. The lake was formed over 2,000 years ago when a chain of volcanoes closed off a basin 37 square kilometers in extent. Hot springs have supplied the lake with minerals and combined with the sunlight of Iceland's long summer days produced a wealth of plant and animal life. The lake also bears the scars of greater upheavals in the past. Pseudo-craters are not really craters at all, but the eroded remnants of giant solidified bubbles in the lava that formed the lake. These latest lava beds have been exposed for 2,000 years but the vegetation they support is still sparse and specialized. A few mosses and some stunted birch trees clinging to crevices in the rock. But the uniqueness of the lake arises from the water itself, in the shape of the black flies that give Mivatn its name. In countless millions they hatch every summer, covering the rocks beside the lake and swarming over the grassy banks like steam, an amazing swirling mist of life. The air is filled with the sound of their wings, and as a source of food, they attract all kinds of hunters. The resident Icelandic spiders capture more than they can possibly eat. Each fly lives for only a few days, but new waves of adults are constantly hatching to replace the dead, so that the numbers stay astronomical for most of the summer. For scientists and people who come to film this great natural spectacle, the flies present a test of devotion to duty. The flies are the key to the whole complex magic of Mivatn. These swarms provide food for the large numbers of waterfowl which assemble here to breed. Here a huge mass of nourishing gnats has been gathered by the breeze into a convenient soup. A Slavonian grebe picks daintily at the flies, building up its strength for the breeding season.
but a Barrow's golden eye, one of Iceland's resident ducks, takes them in by the billful. Fishermen too join in the harvest of summer, catching the fat char, a delicious trout-like fish for which the lake is famous. The Arctic terns, taking their share of the fishermen's catch, have travelled further than any of the birds that come to the lake. They spend the northern winter as far away as the coasts of South America and South Africa, even the edge of the Antarctic ice. But for them, the journey north pays dividends in security and food. The food chain of the lake starts with the fertile mud and sunlight producing huge quantities of plant life. It continues through the flies and fish to the birds. Through an arctic turn, the effects of Mivatan's fertility may travel far into the southern hemisphere. Large flocks of ducks come to the lake, mainly from Europe. The Barrow's golden eyes are native Icelandic ducks and many of them spend the winter on the lake, round the hot and cold springs where the water never freezes. In spring, they are joined by others, which have spent the winter at the coast. This is when courtship begins. In their distinctive breeding plumage, each male must attract and win a female as quickly as possible, for although the days are already long, the summer is short. Young males are repulsed by the adult drakes. Another resident Icelandic duck is the harlequin, aptly named for its colourful breeding dress. The female is rather drab, but the courting drake follows her every move. When it comes to finding a nest site, the harlequin duck has an advantage over other species which come here because it feeds in the rushing streams which flow into the lake and can nest along their banks. Its extraordinary skill in white water frees the harlequin from competing with the other species of ducks which live on calmer water. When a nest site is found, the birds advertise their arrival, calling and head bobbing, and receive a warning not to trespass from a neighbouring pair. Once the boundaries have been established, the pair can take their first meal in their new home, diving to collect fly larvae from the stream bed. An arctic species which comes to breed at Mivatten is the long-tailed duck, also known in America by the name of Old Squaw. The male must seek out his mate among the hordes of other ducks on the lake. Only about 400 among the 30,000 visitors are likely to be of his own species. A female responds to his call and soon another pair will be established for the season.
a passing golden eye drake is driven off. Barrow's golden eye has preferential treatment when it comes to finding a nest site. In fact, the Icelanders call it the house duck because it nests so readily in their houses and outbuildings. Soon after the young hatch, it's time for them to leave their unusual nest site. This duck leads the way and calls for her ducklings to follow. Complete, the female Barrow's golden eye leads her ducklings safely to the lake. But there are still dangers in store for both the young and their parents on the Lake of Flies. The gyre falcon, once the most highly prized of all hunting birds among the nobility of Europe, breeds here in the rock outcrops around the lake. It builds its eyrie high in the lava cliffs. The young falcons are provided with ducks from among the visiting waterfowl on the lake. These birds are at the very top of the lake's food chain. Gyre falcons are strictly protected. Only about five pairs breed here each year, and the loss of a few ducks is a small price to pay for their continued survival. Perhaps because of this steady pressure from gyre falcons and other birds of prey, Barrow's golden eye nest naturally in holes, usually in lava. Farmers have exploited this habit by encouraging the ducks to nest in outbuildings where their eggs are easily available. The association is of long standing and because of the methods used, it actually benefited the ducks in the past. The mother is gently removed and released in the sure knowledge that she will soon come back. Meanwhile, the farmer examines the nest. He always leaves four eggs in the nest to hatch. Anything over four is his share. Although it's going the way of most traditions now, egg collecting from the islands like Slutnus is a time-honoured practice. In the past, as many as 50,000 eggs, mostly scorp, were taken every year and as many again left to hatch. Now the number of eggs laid on the lake is lower, principally because the islands are no longer specially managed to encourage the birds, while introduced mink have disrupted the nesting colonies, making egg collecting less economical. Only a few people nowadays trouble to look for eggs. The children too have been taught to always leave four eggs, ensuring that the duck continues to brood and hatch her clutch so that she will come back next year, ensuring the continuity of the species.
10,000 eggs are still collected annually, but they are now taken only for home consumption. The maximum number of eggs in an undisturbed nest may be up to a dozen, of which all but one or two may hatch. But sometimes two females lay in one nest, and large broods can result. This mother has 13 ducklings, probably not all her own. She takes them for their first diving lesson. Golden eyes feed on fly larvae and the flies themselves, and snails and fish eggs from the lake bottom, so diving is essential behaviour for the young. The duckling's downy coat aids buoyancy, and submerging is no easy matter. But one by one, the ducklings begin to get the knack of submerging underwater. The human fishermen on the lake and in the nearby rivers are not direct rivals of the ducks, but to meet the growing demand for trout, they are using long nylon nets, and the result is a very real threat to diving ducks like golden eyes. It's estimated that a thousand diving ducks are killed during the three and a half months of an Icelandic summer. Most of the casualties occur away from shore, the lake is hardly more than four metres deep anywhere, but for a netted duck, that is deep enough, and most are not as lucky as this one. The danger of fish netting is only the first of the new and growing human pressures on the birds that come to the Lake of Flies. They already have enough natural pressures to contend with, perhaps the greatest of which is the lake's unpredictable weather. Snowstorms can occur even at the height of the breeding season in July. Thousands of young birds may then die, some directly from cold, but others because the flies, their essential food supply, stop hatching for a time. But such sudden onslaughts of bitter weather do not have a lasting effect on the duck population. These are natural hazards and the birds are well able to cope with them. A pair of scorp might bring up healthy youngsters even through a snowstorm. Their natural insulation is effective protection. Mergansas, which spend the winter at sea, are equally safe. Most birds, whatever their size, are well equipped to adjust to temperature changes, surviving to breed another year. The Icelandic golden plover has probably journeyed from the Middle East, one of the hottest parts of the world, to breed here. Scoters, like other ducks which come to the lake from the open sea, are relatively safe while they're here. But many of them die in the winter from pollution of the high seas, along with many other sea and shore birds. The shores of Mivatten have been farmed for hundreds of years, chiefly for sheep, 
with fish and eggs as a sideline without endangering the birds. Many Icelandic farms are built beside geysers and warm springs which supply the farmer with a constant supply of hot water. Lately, however, the hot mineral springs at Mivatn have become the indirect cause of a new threat to the peace of the lake. Dredgers scoop out mud from the lake bottom, part of a profitable industry, for this, owing to the volcanic springs, is no ordinary mud. It's diatomaceous earth made of the skeletons of millions of tiny plants called diatoms, which grow in the lake precisely because it's fed by hot mineral springs. The spring water is rich in silicon, which the diatoms need. The noise of the machinery and the disturbance of the dredging operations have driven the birds away. What used to be a quiet corner, the silence broken only by the calls of birds, is now a diatomite mining settlement. Mivatn's mud is among the purest in the world. It's much in demand by the chemical industry for use in the very finest filters, despite its natural appearance. Ironically, the volcanoes which gave rise to this unique lake, simmering away far underground, are contributing to the new threat to its wildlife, because it's the steam they generate which is used to power the mud processing plant. The peace of this corner of the lake is gone forever, but hopefully the disturbance will not be allowed to spread. But Iceland needs the industry. The factory employs a large number of people and its high quality product is in demand all over the world. The people need somewhere to live and the old settlements, scattered farms and tiny villages just can't accommodate them. The older houses and farms on the lake shores look almost as if they ought to be there. The modern township is brash and conspicuous, but it's fairly compact, taking up only a small part of the lake shore. If it and the industry which brought it into being can be contained, there may still be hope for the lake, which is worth taking care of, not only for the birds, but for people as well. For there's no other place quite like Mivatn, the lake of flies. Texas tomorrow night at the same time where an oil disaster puts wildlife in jeopardy.